I'm going to begin with Eric Wilski. I mean, Frank is a bit of a dick. It must be quite yeah. good fun playing a bit of a dick. Nothing more fun than playing a dick. Mm. Nothing, no bigger challenge in life than playing a dick. Um, no, it was, it was good. It was good fun, actually. Um, yeah, it's, I love the idea of playing a character who, who takes himself so seriously in a film that doesn't take itself seriously at all. You know, it was a good, uh, a good mix. I mean, because of course, just given the nature of your job, mm. you've encountered many members of the press, be it radio journalists, broadcast idiots like me. Do you take, did you take inspiration from that vocation? Anyone that you've kind of encountered encountered across your career? I, I sort of based him more on people that I've heard on the. I, I love listening to radio, you know, and I love people who take their voices very seriously and take themselves very seriously. It's always kind of fun. So he's a bit of a hybrid of a few people I've made observations of over the years, for sure. And your career first began in comedy. Mm -hmm. I mean, of course, you've since become renowned for your sort of dramatic performances, but it must be nice They've to... all been comedies, all my films, haven't they? Oh, yeah. <laughs> if you go back over the last 15 yeah. years, it's a string. Very light string of hijinks. Yeah. Chopper yeah. or so, sort of. A real family adventure movie, that one. Um, but it must be quite nice to kind of return back to, essentially, I guess you could call your mm. kind of career roots. Roots, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, it, was, it was good to go back to a set where you wouldn't get in trouble for having a laugh. You know, because, you know, the myth of laughing on, you know, as an actor is that you'll stop laughing if someone chastises you, which, of course, makes it worse. You know, there's nothing worse than someone going, no, we, we got to go. We, it's nearly lunchtime. I mean, we, we got to get the shot. You know, we got to get. I mean, now we're done. Now that's another half an hour of laughing. So to go to work and, and be allowed and encouraged to, to have fun was, uh, yeah, I, I forgot how much fun that was. Yeah. I don't think I'll carried into the next, I don't think you'll get away with it on another job. So made the most of it. Because when, when you were doing comedy, uh, did you yeah. envisage that you would become a, such a sort of dramatic actor? I mean, was that something you were, because I mean, an actor's career is so much dependent mm. on their next project and what they become sort of known for. Um, how did you see it kind of It's funny, out? I never I never really saw drama as, as this huge kind of uh, unobtainable thing. Like I, I, I was pretty naive. Which, which worked for me. I just assumed that if you're doing sketch comedy, doing sketch comedy and drama is exactly the same thing. It's just one character's making people laugh and the other character sort of isn't. You know, so I never, I never saw it as a huge difference. Um, so it didn't seem unreal to me to be, able to, do, to be able to do both. But I guess it's hard from an audience perception point of view. I was lucky that the internet wasn't really around in the early days. I probably wouldn't have had my career because people were just going, get out of here. I just saw what you did on YouTube. You're an idiot. Go. <laughs> Um, you know, which is what many Australians' attitudes was, was, you know, what are you doing, mate? What's, what's, what are you doing with all those, dra those drama things? Um, you know, so I think perception can have a lot to do with it as well. Yeah. And talking about having uh, fun on set, I remember watching a kind of behind-the-scenes clip from The Office uh, from years ago, and Ricky Gervais would laugh incessantly, mostly at his own jokes. And I was wondering if that was the case on this. Was there lots of cackling? Because he has quite an kind of identifiable yeah. laugh as well. It did. It happened. It happened every day. It happened all day, every day. And I was, you know, as I said before, I was concerned I'd get in trouble, but it was the opposite. And actually, I ended up telling him off, you know, because I was worried we wouldn't get certain angles and certain certain shots. And he'd be like, "It's all right. We don't need it. We'll move on." I'm like, "We can't move on, Ricky. We've got to get this. We've got to get this shot." You know. So it was. It turned out to be almost the opposite. I have to scold him occasionally. But you can kind of begrudge him that because he's a funny bastard, isn't he? Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> And uh, I mean, he's obviously the director and stars in this. I mean, have you ever given much thought of directing? Was he the director? Did he direct this? <laughs> really? Uh, well, apparently so. Ah, oh, I, I hadn't noticed that. I just, yeah, okay. Now, actually, now it makes sense. Okay. But All I was right. just wondering because obviously you have you've done a documentary, um, mm. Love the Beast. But have you given much thought to directing a narrative feature of this nature before? I'd love to, but I'm too lazy. Mm. Yeah. So the ambition just stops after one beer, usually with me. <laughs> Um, it gets quite grandiose and gets quite, you know, quite quite intense, and then it just it just dissipates into the reality. I just know too much. I know too much about how hard work it is, and I just go, yeah, no, I won't, I won't bother with that one. So I just happily uh, ride on the coattails of other people's hard work. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not ashamed of it. <laughs> And what was your take on the film being uh, sort of exclusive to, to Netflix? In a sense, I mean, mm. as nice as it must be to see your work on a, on a big screen, this is more accessible. There's more people seeing this yeah. movie. That must count for a lot as well. Well, it's interesting. I, I'm just going off my family and friends reaction, which is they're just so happy that I'm in a film that they can see. 
I'm like, well, you could actually go to the cinema. And they're like, yeah, I know, but we'll just, I can just watch this. I can just watch this at home. So it's interesting. It's the first time I've been on a, you know, in a project that's that accessible. Um, it's been, you know, nearly 20 years since I did television. So um, it's it's very interesting, actually, and and it's kind of cool. You know, I mean, it's great for me because if you're doing something different, you know, way more people, will, you know, have a chance to to see it. So. Um, uh, I think it's you know hugely important you know for the future of the industry you know to have original programming and original films uh, getting picked up and made you know where normally it might just take longer for them to get made or they get made and they find a really tiny audience you know here will be and anyone can just you know have access to it it's kind of cool and just finally uh, Knights of the Round Table King Arthur mm. is obviously uh, next up for you uh, what's your role in that film how does he fit into that story uh, I kind of come and go a bit it's um, not a huge one so I, I, there's not a whole lot I can divulge but it was great to get a chance to go and work with Guy yeah does he allow much space for sort of comedic performing or, or being quite fun on set because he seems to be that kind of the budget was a little bit higher <laughs> on that one there's a little little bit more uh, yeah I think the, the laugh per minute ratio would have been a bit more expensive on, on, on Guy's film Brilliant. Yeah. We're looking forward to it. Anyway, thank you so much for your Cheers, time. Thank you. Cheers, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, you're watching Hey You Guys. Hey You Guys, huh? Hey You Guys. Is yeah. that from the Goonies? It is indeed, yeah. Nice. Hey You Guys.